to Naive and Dangerous, a podcast about emergent media brought to you by two media researchers. My name is Dr. Christopher Moore, and you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore Moore. And my name is Dr. Ted Mitu, and you can find me on Twitter at Ted Mitu. Hello, Ted. Hello, Chris. How are you? I'm very good. We are in upgraded digs. We are and in a proper radio studio. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very professional. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. We are evolving. So today, uh, the theme uh, is memes. And we, we haven't done as, uh, our, our usual approach, um, which I kind of like, which is to get a couple of quotes. Um, so maybe we need to figure out what our favorite meme is uh, and use that. I have already quotes. You've already got one? Yes. Go for it. Are you ready? Hit me. The best memes are never funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ted is hitting us with his own uh, personal wisdom. Uh, that that uh, love that he loves to uh, throw first year media students with. Um, we we do a lot of meme work uh, in our degree, and uh, students find it very hard to get their head around the idea that the best memes are never funny. I like that that they're never funny as well, not just that they're not funny. Yeah, is they're never funny? So it's like an ontological statement. Uh, and f- recently I've started even pushing it further so I tell them that they are never funny and they are not even visible, right? Because this is part of the argument. But let's rewind, let's rewind because this is jumping directly into very abstract meme theory, uh, which and obviously I use this uh, kind of mimetic uh, statement about memes as a, as a hook to introduce students who are curious about the absurdity of what I'm saying, right? Um, into, into a more complex theory and a more complex understanding of, of media. But we need to rewind and we need to start from the beginning. Let's, uh, let's lay the groundwork. And uh, I think a lot of people will be familiar with the concept of memes and the way they are typically attributed to the work of Richard Dawkins in his book, uh, 1970 book, 1976, sorry, uh, The Selfish Gene. Gene, yeah. Uh, Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist, and he proposed a rather uh, radical, at the time, very interesting way of thinking about information uh, moving evolutionarily. Uh, And I'm pretty sure it was he that described the meme as the smallest unit of cultural reproduction which is a pretty, it's a pretty good place to start with. I did a bit of um, research, a bit of background reading. Uh, Dawkins um, shortened the word meme from the Greek mamima, uh, which means something imitated. But there's also a little bit of prehistory there. Um, the Austrian sociologist, Ewald Herring, used the term daimonimi, uh, which is from the Greek um, meaning memory. Uh, and in 1870, it was used as the title for uh, German biologist uh, Richard Simon uh, from memes. Um, and that, that information is from a great book, actually, uh, an MIT book uh, called From Memes in Digital Culture by Limor Schiffman. And, I, and if you're interested in memes and, and doing your background reading, that's, that's a good place to start. Um, Schiffman has a very different view about memes, and I'm not going to go too much more into that. That's enough there, just to just to give credit. I just wanted to build on on what uh, uh, Chris just said. Um, so when Dawkins coined the term, right, he was he he coined it as a play on words between a gene, the notion of the gene, right, um, a self-replicating unit of biological information, obviously, um, and uh, the notion of uh, uh, mimesis which comes from Greek, which means imitation, right? And then, uh, hence, hence uh, the coinage of meme as a term. And what's interesting about meme as a term that he invented was, um, and the way he deployed it, was that uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a type of information, right, which, is, uh, which should be imagined as a, uh, almost like a self-enclosed, packaged, uh, standalone unit of information, which self-replicates from mind to mind, right? And which uh, survives um, 
across these replications, almost unchanged. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, totally unchanged, sometimes changed completely and remixed, etc., etc. The thing is that it self-replicates from human mind f to human mind. So you can think of it as the way ideas self-replicate from human mind to human mind and survive uh, far longer than their human carriers, right? So this is this is the term that uh, he started with. And uh, what I find interesting here is this idea of uh, imitation. Right, the memetics. Right, so uh, some of you uh, listening to this might have encountered this notion of memetics, and uh, um, uh, the memetic theory, right, is the serious part of studying the studying of memes because you know, uh, and, and this is where it gets deep. Uh, memes are far more uh, than uh, what we see on uh, on uh, Reddit or on uh, basically in internet culture, even though they are the vernacular of the of internet culture. So they're far more because they are. Um, essentially prepackaged kind of semantic um, beings almost. Uh, and it's really cool to think of them as, as uh, uh, beings which replicate themselves uh, from mind to mind and travel from mind to mind. I want to um, go through that again because I think um, I think Dawkins was uh, this was a pretty radical concept and it's it's connected to the way he envisions the gene. Um, and I really liked the, the way you, you kind of talked about the, the meme as a kind of imitation machine, a copy machine. Right? This, is, this is the function of the gene. And Dawkins' work are on our relationship to our own genes, we are, we are alienated from the biological matter that, that reproduces us. And, and you know, I like, I like Dawkins a lot for this because he, he's, he's actually kind of saying the gene has a purpose in, into and of itself that is different from the host that it is part of. And that is, it seeks to replicate. The gene wants to replicate. Uh, do you recall, I mean, I know you do, but uh, uh, our listeners might not, uh, Douglas Adams, right? And uh, <laughs> the big smile, big smile from Chris. Uh, uh, Douglas Adams and uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there is a, there is a, a subplot there about... Uh, computer that is being built, right, to calculate the question, uh, you know, the most important question of the universe about life and the universe and everything else. And and this question is, uh, this uh, uh, computer is actually a biological machine, right? So it's a really interesting parable, I think, uh, that Douglas Adams did on top of Dawkins' work, because uh, this is in effect what Dawkins is arguing about, that our uh, biological makeup uh, for intents and purposes, is is a self-replicating uh, algorithm, which which is going through very complex uh, uh, calculations. Adams was was pure genius, and, and in fact, the the computer that 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 you're talking about was was biological, but it was also geological. It was an entire ecological machine yep. designed to compute the 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 problem of the life, the universe, and everything. And of course, we're talking about the Earth. Uh, as a computer, so um, again to go to go back through that, you know, thinking about the relationship between the gene and the meme, um, if we extrapolate out from the gene as a, as a replication machine, the meme itself is a replication machine. It is it is um, it's it's a little bit like uh, the way in which uh, chemical signals work in in the brain, and, and it, it's shaped in a particular way as to lock into our language and be carried away a bit like a virus and of course a virus is a is a, is a, um, a very insidious gene replicating machine that injects its own dna into our system in order to replicate and that's uh, we will go into that uh, uh, in this podcast because uh, uh, one of the most uh, interesting things about memes, one of the most interesting things the students find about memes once I start introducing them uh, to the more abstract theory uh, and the conceptual kind of toolkit when it comes to understanding what this is all about is the fact that memes can be weaponized, right? And, uh, and what I mean by that is that memes can be loaded with specifically targeted semantic content, right, which targets a specific part of uh, a user group's uh, or a specific user's perception of reality. And... Uh, this sounds unbelievable when you say it. Um, and so usually I have to say into uh, um, describing to students how schema, schema work in, in human minds and how 
uh, we uh, frame our perception of reality in order to perceive, right? So memes can be used to target the schema in long-term human memory, uh, um, and this is they have weaponization vector. They can be used to uh, manipulate and modulate human perception directly uh, without the realization of the carrier. This is beautiful because this um, segues me into the, the thing that I wanted to talk about in, when we started out on memes, and that is Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So we're talking about geniuses. Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash is, uh, in my view, he's, he's, I know we have different views about which book Stevenson is, is, his, is his masterpiece. If, if it's not his masterpiece, it's certainly his manifesto. I actually agree with you that it's his masterpiece. <laughs> it's just not my favorite of his, but you are right that it's his masterpiece. I agree with you. So Snow Crash. Snow Crash is a cyberpunk novel. And in it, I mean, please go out and read it. It's amazing. So sorry to interrupt you, Chris. There are two cyberpunk novels that everyone should read. New Romancer by William Gibson and Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. These are the founding uh, books of the genre and probably the two uh, of the 10 most important science fiction books. Uh, oh, just just philosophy books. If you want to understand the world now, read those yes, Read you, those books. Especially, yes. You, you can read them as philosophy books, yeah. So Snow Crash. In Snow Crash, it's discovered that the ancient Sumerian language functions as a way to program the human brain. It's almost kind of pre-linguistic. It's tapping right into the basic functions of the brain in order to communicate basic technologies uh, called enshobs from memory. So if you wanted to learn how to break, uh, how to make bread, uh, or break stone into the, the right size blocks for con building construction, you would go to the temple and they would share the enshub with you. Num, numshub. Numshub, thank yep. you. Numshub, thank you so much. Um, and that would, that would then program you to go and do this. And so uh, it's, it's, it's supposed that one of the downfalls of the, of the Sumerian Empire uh, civilization was the goddess Asherah, which is actually a linguistic virus. Uh, similar, very similar, we're going back to Dawkins here, right? It's very similar to a computer virus. The god Enki created a counter program um, uh, which uh, caused all of humanity to speak a different language, which therefore stopped the spread of the virus. And so, and it gets, it's it's, it gets even worse than that because <laughs> uh, uh, the goddess uh, Asherah, right? She, uh, it, it's actually, it, she's not even gendered. It's uh, it, she's represented as a goddess, but this is a concept. Um, it's it symbolizes total ordering, right? So what the virus does is it, it reorders everyone into the same basic pattern, right, of thought. So you could think of it as total homogeneity of thought. That's what Asherah does. And what Enki does is uh, introduce chaos. So Enki is a, a chaotic, uh, so he, he symbolizes almost chaotic good here. Now, why are we talking about this? Why we, we always, notice how in every podcast we end up talking about religion and metaphysics, right? For no matter what the topic is. <laughs> Even so, though we're talking about media. Yeah. So what's really interesting here is that uh, the ancients, right, our ancestors in all their wisdom uh, captured uh, through these uh, metaphysic uh, concepts really important insights about the nature of perception, right? And about the, the uh, in, uh, inherent evil in a homogeneity of thought. And this evil, why, why, is, why is it inherently evil to, to have a, a totally homogene, homogeneous society of total agreement, right? Where everyone thinks the same, uh, uh, perceives reality in the same way, right? Because this is an extremely fragile society. Right, so uh, a culture like that has no chance of surviving. A civilization like that has no chance of surviving, and uh, counterintuitively, Enki brings the end of Sumerian civilization in order to save it by injecting it with a chaos virus, right, which causes everyone to start speaking different languages, breaks down the um, you, the homogeneity of perception, therefore saving. Uh, humanity, humanity as a whole, yeah, right? So it, in the in the Bible, this is reflected as the Tower of Babel, right? And uh, the, the humanity trying to build a Tower of Babel to, to rival the gods 
and then the gods striking it down, breaking it in the humanity, dispersing. And notice how the Sumerian myth is so much more interesting than the Bible, because in the Bible there is this thing that like, humanity almost succeeded, whereas the Sumerian myth is about understanding how important it is to have a heterogeneity of perception, to have difference. To bring this back um, to, to Dawkins, um, he, he is more f- uh, famous recently for his um, role in the, the New Atheists and, oh, yeah, yeah. and his <clears throat> views on religion. But we're, we're, we're talking now about some of the proto-memes. In, in his mind, I would argue that, um, that, that, that religion is one of the most powerful memes, and that's exactly what you're talking about there. And, and notice, notice how this legend um, or mythology uh, about this um, Sumerian myth becomes repurposed in, inside another religion as a meme in and of itself. Beautiful example, because this is beautiful example, because that's exactly how memes travel, and that's exactly how they re- self-replicate. Another great example, while you were talking, I was thinking of uh, Yggdrasil, the world tree from Nordic mythology. Notice how the tree is repeating itself as a meme, uh, the tree in terms of uh, a sacred object. You see the same uh, iconography, the same imaginary around it in uh, Native American uh, religions and in uh, all sorts of different Asian religions. Judeo-Christian. Uh, yeah, in, in, uh, yeah the, the role of the cross, the tree of the cross in uh, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, uh, in Nordic, uh, this returns again in when, when Balder is killed on a tree, right? And then you have this in, in Nordic religion. You have this when Odin nails himself to the world tree in order to gain knowledge. So again, what the point that we're trying to make here is that memes... Uh, have existed long before the internet. In fact, memes uh, have been, since uh, the appearance of humanity, the main and primary carrier of uh, the human and of culture. Culture is basically uh, uh, an emergent property of memes. So you have uh, a set of memes operating, um, or rather you could say existing and resonating at a certain frequency which form a local culture. Oh, absolutely, and 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 um, we would think of it also in terms of national culture. How we identify is really just a set of memes. When absolutely. people talk about, you know, what is being Australian, and they talk about cricket and the football mm. and the beach, and you know, the what does it put a put a sausage on the barbie? Like that's that's yeah. a meme, yeah. and that's that's kind of get come back to us when we talk about brands as well. Absolutely. But before we get there, I want to talk. Um, We'll come, we'll come, we'll come back to to, to that. But oh, let's go. Let's you want to go? Yeah, all right. Okay. We 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 we're, we're looking at a word on a screen, and and the word is kekism. Okay. So let's tackle that. So what is kekism? The religion of kek. So that's an emergent phenomenon, uh, which originated on 4chan, and it originated around the 2016 uh, presidential elections in the United States, and uh, it started manifesting itself. Um, through the uh, repetition of numbers on 4chan. Each post, so v- a very quick uh, uh, breakdown here of what is this is all about. So each post on 4chan, which is an anonymous image board after all, um, uh, is anonymous and has uh, automatically generated, randomly generated uh, um, ID number, right? So um, these ID numbers are random generated long strings and uh, very rarely they end up in uh, uh, double or triple similar uh, numbers, let's say uh, two twos or, or three threes, right? So posters on 4chan noticed a very strange uh, development around the end of the 2015 and early 2016 that in threads uh, which discussed President Trump's uh, um, candidacy for, for the presidential elections, you would have an inordinate amount of uh, dubs and trips uh, appearing. Right? And uh, a specific set of doubles and triples would appear, especially uh, associated with seven. So you have two sevens, three sevens, four sevens appearing. And uh, so this started happening again and again, continuously. Remember, these are randomly generated numbers. So um, uh, people started uh, thinking that there is some metaphysical force involved. And uh, so someone started digging, and uh, long story short, uh, this ended up being associated with the uh, ancient Greek uh, god of chaos called Kek. Uh, so Kek is actually an androgynous uh, deity, like uh, most ancient gods, 
uh, the pre-Judeo-Christian tradition. So uh, it it has a female uh, mirror image, right, uh, which is Kekku, and uh, and uh, this is a god of chaos, um, and it's uh, specific. So uh, in in the Greek tradition, chaos was not a, a, a negative thing per se. Chaos was the necessity for the emergence of life. So the hour of the day cycle that was associated with, with Kek and his female representation uh, was just before dawn, right? So chaos is symbolically necessary for the appearance of the sun and of life, right? So uh, Kek is the life giver uh, and at the same time is the, is the absolute enemy of order and order being the, the, the end of life. We're back in Samaria again. That's right. That's exactly what happened. And so people started noticing this. Um, and so Trump ended up being associated with chaos and being uh, being thought of as a chaos agent. And um, whereas Hillary ended up being associated with order, right? His, Hillary being his presidential opponent. And then um, very, so remember that uh, the speed of posting and the speed of engagement in 4chan is pretty much insane in internet terms. So uh, over a few months, you had a detailed uh, religion emerging, uh, a cult of Kek, uh, 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 people paying attention to number appearances, people started paying attention to random appearances of um, uh, frogs because the, the, the uh, physical representation of Kek in the Egyptian pantheon was as a green frog. And then guess what? Pepe the Frog emerged as the dominant meme at that time, right? And so Pepe emerges, and then Kek emerges, and Pepe being the physical representation of Kek uh, in meme culture. And here you have the emergence of uh, uh, the, the most powerful memetic trope of 2016 and 17, right? And uh, you know Pepe is now you know the Nazi frog, interestingly enough, or, or according to many uh, uh, people critiquing this. Interestingly enough, and uh, just a moment, Chris. Interestingly enough, today in the morning, uh, when I was uh, I was checking out what's happening in Hong Kong because we have the Hong Kong protests, and guess what? The official mascot of the Hong Kong protests is Pepe the Frog, <laughs> Pepe the, the frog. Green Frog, the Chaos Agent. <laughs> He's back in action in Hong Kong. It, it, uh, Pepe is an interesting one, particularly when you look at um, how uh, traditional legacy media covered uh, the emergence of this phenomena. It was almost unable to understand it in any, it didn't fit into any of the established tropes, which are just memes. memes. Um, and so therefore uh, the meta meme emerged that this meme is a, a symbol of the alt-right. Yeah. Thus beca- and then flattening out into another meme in yes. and of itself. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, w- abstracting now into a, a probably a more interesting conversation, it's really hard for established uh, uh, legacy media to engage with this world. Uh, because first of all, this is an uh, organic world. And second of all, it's chaotic. So the nature of memes at, their, uh, at the level where you could imagine them as this pulsating s- semantic entity. Semantic here stands for carrying meaning, right? So why pulsating? Because it, they, they're constantly being engaged with, right? If a meme is not engaged with, it's dead. Right, it doesn't it's, exist. It's the dialogic nature yeah. of the internet ma- makes it almost impossible for monologic media to engage with. Um, you know, m- m- text you know can't ba- basically can't engage with it unless it introduces images, uh, audio, visual, m- you know, television news basically can't engage with it because it's just a it's a single one one direction statement about the thing so it can't actually fundamentally engage with it with the, the way in which it operates um i can we can we just track back a little bit because i want to i want to unpack this discussion um and talk a little bit more about the the prehistory of memes before the internet before mm. we, before we get into it and and lay some some further thinking about how memes pre-exist the internet um one of my one of my favorite uh memes that uh, you, you probably know about is is Kilroy was here, mm. and this is a famous image of a kind of large nosed figure peering over a a wall, and um, this meme uh, appeared uh, uh, he, uh, through um, building construction in in America, and it was a. Um, a guy whose job it was to examine the rivets after construction. Mm. And so after he would come in and he would inspect the rivets and they were properly installed, he would write on the wall, Kilroy was Mm. here. And then that evolved 
Um, and so that, that, that I like this because this is, this is graffiti. This is, and so, you know, this unpacks this whole conversation about, um, the memes that we see in the everyday, in the physical environment. I don't know about you, but I used to love living in, in well, no, I didn't like living in Melbourne. That's a lie. <laughs> but one of the things that I actually enjoyed about Melbourne was the train rides through the various suburbs and seeing the graffiti mm. and seeing the shift in the graffiti from different suburbs. Mm. And the shift in the graffiti over time, in which different styles come out, and and this 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 um, this desire for, of humans to write on surfaces um, is is a meme in itself. Then uh, print memes. See, I keep wanting to. <laughs> students are laughing at me because that's a meme in itself. Now dig deeper. <laughs> <laughs> I used it myself in the lecture the other day. <laughs> I was like, to quote my colleague, "Let's dig deeper." So, uh, what what I find really interesting here is, uh, and again, this kind of uh, echoes back to this notion of the best memes are never funny, and are invisible. That uh, while each and every aspect of vernacular culture, right? Vernacular culture is, is our jargon for uh, everyday culture, the, the organic culture that uh, we all live and breathe in and we produce and, and participate in, um, which is not elitist, right, by, by distinction. Um, the interesting thing about this is that there is a substratum, which is where the powerful memes reside, right, and which is invisible, right? So in terms of, you asked me about print, and I was explaining this to, to a student some time ago. Uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive. It's hard to wrap yourself, uh, your head around this. See, print was, uh, why was print never as, as uh, pervasive? And why was, for example, print propaganda never as pervasive as radio, right? Because print requires the ability to read, right? It requires not only the simple uh, act of literacy as recognizing a, a, B, C, a, B, C, and D, but also the kind of more advanced act of uh, um, translation. Uh, translation into uh, complex meaning, right? So um, print and print memes could only reach so far. It's only when the radio appeared, right? And it's very interesting. You can d uh, totally, and this we're reaching the, uh, into media history, when radio appears and when... Uh, it's yeah. You want to interrupt? I, I agree with you. I do, but I, I, I think we we start to see it with the invention of the novel and the invention of stereotypes and tropes and genres. I think these are all mimetic structures. They they have always existed. It's, it's right, of it's, course. Preprint. Yes. They've always existed. Preprint in it's, stories. It's just that they've always been part of oral culture. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With the novel, and again, keep in mind, you know, we have the serialization of the novel, the, 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 what we now read as uh, uh, the epitome of the novel, like the three musketeers. Everyone knows the three musketeers. What few people know is that it actually appeared in newspaper, right? It, it was a serialized newspaper publication. But again, remember, this uh, reaches only a limited audience, yeah. right? The people who can read. And so uh, what I wanted to point at is that there is this substrata of, of uh, uh, memetics, which uh, we cannot see, we, it's not uh, or rarely is visual. Uh, often it's uh, operating simply at the level of perception in general. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and prop map, map this in Russian fairy tales. Yes. Uh, and we see this in, in stories and, and, of course, players coming from village to village telling the same stories that they, they know because the memes have been shared. So you know when the villain is on stage. You know yes. when, when the, the princess is going to be, even if you're right at the back and you can't see anything and you can't hear anything. This is the power of folk culture, actually. And that's why, and people figured it out, interesting enough, in the history of uh, uh, Western civilization, people figured this out only in the end of the 19th century, thanks to the Romantics movement, when they started mapping, as a conscious effort, mapping folk tales. Right, the Brothers Grimm, everyone knows the Brothers Grimm. What, again, few people know that these people are actually walking from village to village in Germany and collecting fairy tales. Right, it's they are not these fairy tales are not invented by them, right? By any means. So, what's important here is that when you look at all these fairy tales, what you have there is very carefully uh, packaged mimetic material, right? Which has been replicating itself through enormous uh, length of time, uh, and has been prepackaged and it's effective and has survived because it carries specific kind of uh, technologies. Uh, it's it's technology and it's a. Uh, 
uh, um, you know, you know how you know zip files, right? Compressed files. So this is compressed zip file culture, right? And zip file uh, life instructions, right? So when massive children, amounts of information. Yes, mm-hmm. and when children receive this meme- these memes early on in their lives, these memes are unpacked in their mind and they set the entire the parameters, their, their, you could say their, the core frame of reference through which they perceive reality. Aesop's fairy tales are another set. Yes, absolutely. This not, is the, and it's not just reduced to morals. It's not morals. Are, moral is a kind of very superficial level of, of, of looking at this, right? So this is a full on uh, um, kind of agency tropes, right? How to act in certain situations, how to perceive reality, right? Um, and and this applies, uh, uh, how, for example, the importance of bravery. Right? How to defeat fear, right? Why is it so important, for example, that children read stories about uh, defeating dragons? Uh, what's so important about that, right? Oh, poor dragons, right? Why are we hurting them, right? But what's important here is that dragon symbolizes uh, 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 insurmountable obstacles. And the fact that you have heroes who challenge insurmountable obstacles, uh, uh, it's, it's almost like a, you could think of it as a, a thinking pattern about how you should approach insurmountable obstacles in your own life. Right, um, the, the 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 common trope or meme of, of being tricked or tricking someone, yes. or you know using the situation to your advantage, not simply going in and, and reading things at face value. These are all just deployed super simply through these very very fundamental, but you know still interesting tales. There's still there's still heroes. There's still um, it's not just melodrama. W- one of the really interesting uh, arguments that uh, you could make here, and again I'm keeping at this point that you raised about uh, uh, print, is that uh, uh, what's so important about uh, the Gutenberg revolution? Remember, uh, guys, Gutenberg invented the printing press, right, and started... Uh, uh, movable type printing yeah, press. Yeah, m- moving movable type printing press. Uh, and so this is the mid-15th century, uh, started a revolution in uh, uh, printing, revolution in reading, right, and uh, led directly to the Protestant revolution in Europe. So what's interesting... And, and arguably led to the end of the Middle Ages. So what's really important about this is that, from the perspective of our conversation, is that up until that time, the, even though uh, on paper Europe was for uh, 1,000 years uh, Christian, right? up until what, that time, folk culture uh, was barely at all Christian uh, because people just, uh, the majority, of, enormous majority of people didn't read. Um, and uh, didn't engage with the Bible in any way, but the Bible being the, being the source code for, for that religion, right? So they engaged uh, with the religion through the prism of the pre-Christian folk beliefs, folk practices, which, had, uh, which were memes with tremendously long traction. Which is why so many of those stories and mythologies and tales get incorporated into the Bible because that's the language that they spoke. Yes, and they they get incorporated specifically in the way that the, uh, the religion is interpreted in uh, in uh, local folklore throughout uh, throughout Europe, and and so this ended when the majority of people started reading and started reading the Bible. So you have this, uh, dramatic upheaval, dramatic. Upheaval. You have two hundred years of nonstop warfare in Europe resulting from the printing press, right? So just wrap your head. Everything ends with the Westphalian peace, uh, 1648, right? And we are living still in the aftermath of the Westphalian peace where the nation state gets defined as a concept, right? So this is the power of memes, right? Uh, This is how powerful memes define human perception. And when you uh, tweak uh, at that fundamental source called human perception, you're basically tweaking everything about reality. And that's the point, returning to, to how we started, that's the point, this is what Enki did, right? He, he wrecked the, the source code of perception. I want to take this now into audiovisual culture, um, particularly because there is an affective value of memes. And by affective, uh, I mean emotions, I mean the feelings, but I also mean precognitive. They, they hit you mm. before you know that they've hit you. Yes. They 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 reach into your brain before you have the the, the time to process the fact that you've processed. Yeah, that's them. why they're invisible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is where advertising and marketing culture really gains its footing in the twentieth century 
through uh, not only brands and corporate logos. Uh, I mean, you can take it back to the formation of the nation state and the national flag, of course, as, as an important meme. But uh, jingles. Jingles, okay. slogans. Jingles. Um, there was an, you know, an entire industry around crafting jingles that hit you affectively, that you were, you were humming them. On, yeah. You know. And the key is that you're building an associative pairing in the, in the mind uh, which uh, directly affects perception between that the brand and the jingle. So if the jingle uh, uh, is associated in the mind with a positive feeling, with a positive emotion, the brand is automatically also associated in the mind with that positive feeling and emotion, right? So you have a, a shortcut. This is a, I was explaining this to students the other day, actually, when I was, uh, um, I was giving a seminar, three-hour seminar on framing, that this is basically the major exploit in human perception uh, on top of which the entire marketing, advertising, and PR industries are uh, built. It's only one exploit, and using hacker language here, right, in terms of computer exploit. This is one exploit between, uh, because shall we go into the process now? Just to yeah, quickly. So, so what's it. happening is when you're perceiving reality that uh, you have short-term and long-term memory, right? And the way something is transitioned from short-term where you've just seen it into long-term where you're, you're starting to think it and it starts affecting how you see is through associations, right? So you have preset in your long-term memory uh, kind of rule sets for meaning, which we call in, in uh, media theory schema. And this schema end up defining how you perceive reality, how you think about it, right? And, and how, how you, you respond to new information coming in. Absolutely. And this schema um, define the, your capacity for perception because if you cannot link what you see with existing schema, you literally cannot see it. Right? And this is usually where students are lost because it sounds counterintuitive. But what happens is that without uh, an associative link that you can build with your schema, this thing that you see doesn't make sense. You literally cannot perceive it properly. So what happens is that uh, in that case, that you end up doing uh, a, a completely different association. And the classic example here is of the kid who you know, has never seen a horse but knows dogs. So it looks like the horse, oh, look, that it is, that's a it's big, big dog, right? Um, um, because it knows dogs, and it knows that dogs have four legs, right? So um, uh, the other example here is, again, a classic uh, where Cortes, uh, which is the, the Spanish conquistador who conquered Mexico, con uh, Cortes and his 150 men landed on the coast of Mexico and you know, started, uh, had their first encounter with the Aztecs, and they were, they were on horse. And the Aztecs had never seen horses because there were no horses in Central and North America at the time, and they had never seen uh, certainly humans on horses. So what they saw is they considered that this, obviously they couldn't map this to any existing schema. So they, they, the only thing they could associate this with is, so obviously they speak, and they have the uh, uh, partial appearance of humans, so they must be some superhumans, See, therefore gods, right? And the first association that the Aztecs built with, for the conquistadors is gods. These are gods. The gods have come to visit us, right? Uh, so yeah. Um, so a recent example of this um, would be, of course, the introduction of the internet. And when you look at um, the basically 1995 onward, with the uh, packaging of Internet Explorer in uh, Windows 95, Microsoft's operating system, you you can look at the the the, the news coverage of the time in paper and and um, in print and and television. And you get all these new metaphors um, being used to describe the internet and try to figure out what the internet was because there's no established schema. Is it an information database? Is it a place? A superhighway. Uh, a a superhighway. Um, superhighway, of course, being... Um, Al Gore. Al Gore. Yeah. Uh, and, and that actually came out of a, a, a white paper. So that's the government's... You know, the, the, the schema there for government was, okay, well, how do we regulate this? Well, how do we regulate other transit lanes yeah. and, 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 you know, major found, um, infrastructure yeah. like a highway? Yeah. Um, the, the popular metaphor at the time, of course, was, the, was surfing the web, mm -hmm. right? And largely because this was such, this was a tsunami of 
of information yes. and, and possibility and, and a total reordering of how media operated, that how else would you how else would you understand this apart from a giant wave crashing down on you? How do you survive that? Will you surf down the, the, the face? Um, and so the, over the, you know we've been we've been developing the schema for thinking about the internet for for 10, 15, 20, 20 years mm-hmm. now. And the problem is that it keeps changing. Yeah, see, the, the, the internet is chaotic, right? It's the domain of Enki and Kek, right? So it's, there's, it, and, and you can see that this is the primordial battle of the internet is between uh, uh, the forces of order and the forces of chaos. Um, and uh, um, it, it, this is the battle for meaning, of course. I just wanted to return back to this point that you made because it's a brilliant example of uh, the, uh, the, the serious cognitive problem we face, and we actually, all of us face it on a daily basis when we encounter something we've never seen, uh, and, and we struggled to, we struggled to actually make meaning of it, right? So this is the expl- exploit moment, right? This is the mimetic exploit moment. Um, and uh, um, the broadcast media, uh, what we call the legacy media, and the uh, uh, public relations, uh, advertising industry, propaganda, right? They all use this one exploit, where uh, something often something we would otherwise find totally undesirable is being carefully packaged as a mimetic message to appeal to specific schema in our minds, right? To associate with specific schema in our mind in order to persuade us to engage or, or like that or buy that. Example, this week, um, of course, we've seen a, a, we've seen two mass shootings in the United States um, just this week. Um, you know, that, that seems to be increasingly the case in, in the United States. And you have politicians coming out and deploying the the um, the favorite um, moral panic uh, video games yeah. are to blame and of course you know um, violence in society has been the cause has been caused by uh, movies it's been caused by comic books it's been caused by novels uh, whichever whichever media is convenient to blame at the time this 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 because it's much too difficult um, and much too much money invested in gun control or anti-gun control, so we can't we can't tackle that. That's in, that's impervious. So we deploy this this meme, this trope of oh well, it's violent media that's making us. Um, it's um, the, what what is happening is a specific uh, chain of associations, right? The the and and how it works, and you can observe it once you, when you train yourself to look for it. You can observe it continuously. This is how f- uh, framing works actually, and how a mimetic warfare works, uh, where you create a specific chain of associations, right? You isolate them um, and and uh, craft all your content, all your visuals, if you will, or audio, for that matter, into that spe- uh, specific to to repeat that specific chain of associations, and then you keep repeating it. Right? Repetition is really important here because you're creating the illusion of persistence. Uh, so what happens is that um, when uh, a user right, or, or an audience segment keeps encountering the same piece of information, the same meme, uh, and, and making the same association, this association is translated into schema. And once that happens, once it goes into, once it goes into long-term memory schema, it starts uh, determining perception. This is why Fox News is so powerful because it, they have the control and they have the affiliates and they they uh, they post how to frame this piece of information. They provide the keywords and it gets repeated and repeated. Yep. It doesn't matter where you go; it's repeated and it's repeated. And when you look at when you look at how really successful advertising campaigns operate, they usually operate by specifically exploiting associative chains, uh, which write emotion. Because remember, uh, that's the other thing. Uh, Emotion uh, always beats uh, conscious cognition because emotion is precognitive, right? So emotion appears always first. Uh, if you imagine the, the mind as a operating system, emotion boots in before the cognitive operating system boots in, right? Uh, it predates that. It's the mind-body problem. People think that the mind is separate to the body, but no, the body actually receives information first that then is transmitted yes. to the mind, and the mind then Chem- processes that and then backfills the emotion. That's right. So it's you should think of it as mult- multiplicity of layers as opposed to two things, right, in, in opposition. So what's important here to understand is that when you observe, for example, a successful brands like Nike or Apple or whatever, in fact, all brands who, which are successful operate on the same exploit by... 
uh, creating memes which appeal to specific emotional states. Um, for example, Nike in its uh, efforts to appeal to uh, the female market uh, pos- uh, always notice how it positioned itself as a uh, uh, successful women overcoming. There is always an e- element of overcoming, right? So th- this is the, the narrative of uh, empowerment, the meme of empowerment, which is already positioned in people's minds as a schema. Uh, so they're using that schema and the immediate dopamine reward from succeeding in overcoming, right? Th- this goes to user interface as well. Like r- one of the reasons why the Apple iPhone and and other smartphones haven't evolved in 10 years time is because of the visual interface of the app is so successful in organizing the schema in which way the schema of the way in which you interact with that device. Um, the why are we still dealing with with icons, right? Because they are visually affective yeah. and, and they 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 frame or they shape the way in which we use that device. So the word here that uh, we're using is, uh, uh, it, and it's not a word actually, it's an expression that we're using to describe this phenomenon is limbic resonance. Uh, and uh, Elon Musk famously used it uh, in uh, in uh, his podcast with uh, Joe Rogan to, to uh, describe one of the really important things of uh, uh, the way Instagram and uh, uh, I think he was talking about Instagram um, in actually succeeds, right? So what's happening here is that you have direct link uh, uh, routing around the cognitive functions of the brain into the emotional schema, which is primary. Remember that, right? The child first feels and then thinks. So the first schema that laid in your mind, uh, emotional schema. So when you manage to route around the cognitive schema and de- go directly to associations with emotional schema, that's when your um, the meme that you're loading in people's minds is, is that much more successful. And that's what that's limbic resonance because you're talking directly to the limbic nervous system, which is the primary nervous system of the human body. Right? You, in effect, you're directly talking to the human body. And check this out. We are returning back to the Sumerian language. <laughs> that's how we started, didn't we? <laughs> Talking to the body directly, no. So um, one of the the things that we've we've kind of skirted around a little bit is mimetic warfare and radicalization mm. of memes, and it's interesting to see how legacy media um, has responded to meme culture, and again through a meme in associating it with the alt right and um, radical politics. Um, where, where do you, where do you, where is this where is this going? And what I mean by that is, uh, it has been interesting to see just how quickly the evolution of memes has um, become on the internet. There was a period, say over the last ten years, where if you look at meme culture, even five years ago, you get um, static memes, so boilerplate memes, yeah. the meme genres yeah. that get de- get deployed. That's that seems to have shifted um, a little bit now, mainly through remix culture. Now it's now you now it's kind of re- reducing the boilerplate to just simple words and texts. But then you then you can go on Reddit and you can look at look at subreddits like um, the the meme economy, uh, dank memes, yep. which is quite fun. Um, one of my one of my favorites is um, I'm sorry, John, which is the the Garfield mm. um, Lovecraft memes. Uh, the, just the, the the rate and speed of change in mimetic culture is is enormous. Does that proceed to infinity? What what happens there? Yeah, I think it proceeds. This is chaos, right? Remember that, right? This is the domain of Keck, and uh, it is chaos, and that's the beauty of chaos is uh, infinity. Remember this: chaos is infinite, right? Only order is bounded, because the 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 logic of order is control, a, a control, and erecting a wall. Right, chaos is infinite. Uh, chaos doesn't doesn't have any use for walls or control, right? It's just they are antithetical to each other. So uh, it, it proceeds in uh, ever increasing cycles of, of uh, reproduction. And you 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 are very right to point out that in, uh, in mimetic culture on the internet started with uh, memes having very long very long shelf life and being used across uh, um, let's call them semantic genres, and now. Um, you have niches within niches within niches and cycles of uh, like frequency of innovation going into 
uh, from weeks to days to, to often hours, right? With new content and completely new templates being appearing. This is on, on meme economy subreddit, for example. Uh, and this is talking about Reddit and not 4chan. So what's, uh, what's interesting here in terms of where this is going, um, I think ever increasing uh, um, uh, chaos, ever increasing uh, uh, evolution, uh, being paired, and that's th that's the other thing of this. The, the other aspect of this phenomenon is that chaos is never in, in isolation. There is always order uh, battling it. So we will have, I think, ever increasing efforts uh, on behalf of uh, the forces of order in this universe, which is basically the big tech companies, the governments, uh, all sorts of uh, three-letter agencies, trying to stamp out meme culture and to to bring order into that universe, right? So you would have this continuous uh, battle. This is the the battle of, uh, um, this is the defining battle of this universe, I think, the battle between chaos and order. It's the, the, most, the most ancient mythological battle. If you look at Sumerian uh, mythology, this is the battle of uh, uh, Tiamat versus Enki, which is the, uh, the chaos and, and, uh, and order. Um, another thing I wanted to say is this, uh, uh, meme warfare and uh, extremism and, and uh, the use of uh, uh, meme warfare in uh, the proliferation of extremist ideologies and uh, extremist movements. You, have, you see meme warfare being used by uh, Islamic terrorism and you see it being used in uh, uh, the entire spectrum of uh, extremism uh, in the, the Western political ideologies from right to left. Um, it has different shades, different... Uh, you could, you could say that you could differentiate it into genres. That's probably a PhD there in the making. But uh, it definitely is present. Uh, I don't think it can be stamped out uh, because the genie is out of the bottle. It's been interesting to see the way in which some nation states have responded to meme culture. Um, there are there are places that, you know, for China, for example, where certain memes are, are very yeah, sensitive. Forbidden. Yeah. Forbidden, you yeah. know. Uh, Russia as well, I think, has... Oh, with, with Putin memes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and some of those were great memes. Like, if I was, if I was um, Putin, I, I'd, you know, I'd be... <laughs> I'd be celebrating that. But there's an image... Like, so, but the meme that he's created about himself is then being challenged by the memes of, of, of the user. So when you, when you talk about mimetic warfare... I think it's going to be interesting in the future to see actual meme cultures go to war with oh, each other. You have so, this. You have this. I mean, you had this already in 2016, right? So the the classic example here is the uh, the fortune meme that the left can't meme, right? Because the uh, the way the Democratic Party was set up with its entire media apparatus and the ad agencies that were involved around the Hillary Clinton campaign, which is the top ad agencies from New York. Uh, were completely blindsided by by meme culture, right? They're, they're blindsided to an astonishing effect. And so, uh, hence the meme that the left can't meme. And of course, which is not true, any culture can meme, right? As long as it's an operational culture. It means it has memes. <laughs> the, the the question is about, the, the I guess, the intensity of uh, production and the kind of the protocols for replication and for variation. And this is where I think political culture plays a role because uh, the left is certainly much more controlling uh, in its current uh, iteration in the West when it comes to uh, reproduction and uh, variation as opposed to what we see in this chaotic right that emerged in the, in the US specifically. This is interesting because it's, we're starting to ask questions now about um, how you actually... Um, critique a meme how do you start to create a language with which to assess a meme for its effectiveness and i think if we're back to chaos and, and control as soon as you start to control a meme it loses its affective potential it, it's immediately shut down and just building immediately on what you said the reason it loses it is because you are starting to think in terms of genetics right you're preventing a gene from evolving in a certain way that's what you're doing by, by trying to control meme culture, right? So it immediately loses its uh, elan vital, right, to use Burke's on. It stops being a living thing anymore because you're, you're precluding it from evolving in a certain way, being replicated, being remixed in a certain way. Now I have a, a mental image of um, ad agency executives 
um, collecting memes like butterfly culture, you know, like you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, butterflies yeah, that, and pin them to a yeah. board. And like, okay, so this is this is the Pepe meme. We're yeah, how do, what can we do with that? Put a pin in that yeah. now, and now it's dead, and we can look at it, and that's fine. But that's as good as it gets. That's the thing I didn't get about the Pepe creator. I, I think this guy just totally doesn't understand what's happening. Uh, the artist who actually drew Pepe, instead of being uh, 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 thankful and inspired uh, uh, by the fact that his creation has ended up being a, a, a profound uh, uh, internet culture movement, which is not only associated with the right, uh, not at all. But right. th- but this is this is very much traditional view of creativity and owning intellectual property. Yeah, like it's very much that you have to own it, you have to control it, you have to police it in order for it to remain yours. And we're moving to a stage where that becomes less and less viable. And this, dear listeners, is where uh, this pretty much what Chris just now said is pretty much the most important thing you you should be taking out of this podcast, uh, because at the end of the day, this is an ideological issue, and it's one of those fundamental issues where you either get it or you don't. And the issue is this intellectual property when it comes to ideas is absurd, uh, and it's evil. Right, this is the forces of order. This is Ash, uh, uh, Ashera, Ashera. Uh, and you don't want to be on on Ashera's side in this. Right, you want to be on Enki's side. Uh, ideas cannot be controlled; should not be proscribed. Well, I think that <laughs> is, is a pretty good note uh, to end on. Did you have anything else that you wanted to? Oh, we can keep talking. I mean, about totally. This, but it's we, well, we we might come back to this in in the future, and this is a, a good groundwork for us to build on. Um, when we when we come back and we can get different people to talk about memes in the future. Let's do that. So uh, thank you, Ted. Um, I'd like to uh, praise Inky and Kek. Yes, and praise Kek. <laughs> and uh, we'll sign off there. You can find me uh, on Twitter at CL Moore. And you can find me on Twitter at Ted Thank See you, guys. And See you, you online. online. <laughs> <laughs>